All right, it is 11.01, so we are gonna kick things off. So what I'll do is I'll just do a little introduction here to Christopher and he will take it away. So um, for those of you who are here that are not our clients, generally these are just reserved for our clients where I have either myself or someone speak about a topic. And we wanted to make this public because I think this will be the most valuable for the community. And so Chris has been a client of ours for many years now. And one thing that I wanna say about Christopher and his firm is he is one of the most diligent people I've seen in the sales process, working the leads, being very intentional in what he does. It's been extremely impressive in um, in just watching his firm grow and the consistency with which he has done it. And so uh, I've been trying to organize this for a while. Christopher is very busy. So he's been nice enough to come on here and present this to us. And you guys can ask questions at the end. Um, you can talk to Chris about working with him on a more intimate basis if you're interested in that at the end. And so I'll let Christopher take it away, introduce himself perhaps better than I did and run with this presentation. So it's all yours, Christopher. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much, Elliot. And yeah, the, 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 what Elliot just said is absolutely true. I've been working with Empirical um, for, gosh, it's got to be, we're not, we're three years ish, somewhere in there. Um, but um, we, uh, you know, I think people might ask, I think the most important question is why um, we're doing this. And so I'll just do this as the finish of the introduction. I'll introduce myself in a second. But the truth is, is that, that I think, um, this title slide says it all, which is that lawyers have a very strange relationship with sales. Um, and most of most attorneys that I know and work with, and I do work with attorneys um, in addition to building uh, four law firms, um, you know, I work with attorneys to help them with their law firms and their sales process and their operations process and lots of other things. And the relationship is one that like it's an aversion. Like we shouldn't have to sell like back to the, uh, you know, build a better mousetrap and the world will be the path to your door or just sort of like that for some reason as a, as a profession, we're above sales. And when I talk more deeply with people about that, um, it becomes clear why we feel that way. And the truth is I felt that way because we spent our lives from be it from you know, when we're children on up being sold to and it's distasteful and you know we 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 cast some sales in a negative light like you know the the, the whole trope of a used car salesman right and you know i have friends who are used car sales people and they're nice people um and and the, but i've seen them do it right and i've seen them do it wrong and so that's why i wanted to title this one good lawyers never sell and what I mean by that is that they never do that bad thing, right? Never do the selling to people. Because when we sell to people, we are generally trying to convince them to do business with us. And if you look at that and think about that sentence, convince them to do business with us, that whole mindset is around us. It's convincing someone else to do something that they may or may not need to do for us. And good lawyers never do that. And that's what we're going to be talking about here. So we're going to revision in this concept. Sales is a service. It's something we do for our prospective clients. One of the things I do with my sales team, and I encourage everybody to do, is I reward them for people who do not buy from us, who do not do business with us, if they give us a five-star Google review um, because it is more important to me that we have delivered a service. We delivered value even to a prospect that doesn't buy because when you do that, it pays off in dividends um, in spades. I mean, it just really, really does uh, down the road. You, you're creating an ambassador for your business, which is worth more um, than any marketing you could possibly do. All right, let's get going um, with the, uh, let's see if we can get those slides going. There we go. Um, so let's start with part one, because this is a part I think that most people skip. Um, and so I actually had this further down in the presentation that I was thinking about. I was like, you know what? This really belongs at the beginning because it should be in the beginning of how you think about sales. What is sales job in your firm? Right. What is what is sales supposed to do for your firm? And I'm not going to I have a whole other webinar about building this plan. I'm not going to do that here. But I wanted to just kind of go to the right to the punchline. 
which is sales should have a specific job, which starts with your budget, which starts with your business plan. And so you should decide, and you know, this is what we're two days away from December. This is the perfect time of year to be thinking about this kind of thing is in 2024. What is your business supposed to do your law firm, your business supposed to do for you? How much money should it be sending home as net revenues as profit to you <laughs> and the owners of the firm? And everybody, please excuse us. We'll cough a couple of times during this webinar. I had COVID um, last weekend, so just getting back from that. But uh, And so you have to decide that. And that, that's something like you should be doing your business planning. It's like, I expect this firm into which I'm investing all my time, my sweat, my blood, my tears, my sleepless nights to deliver something for me. And that thing should be, you know, the amount of money I take home. And then, you know, I don't know what your profit margin is. So we're just going to use a 25% profit margin for this example. So in this example, this this attorney owner or group of attorney owners said that the business should throw off a half a million dollars in revenues to them, in, in profit to them, I should say. So and if they're 25% profit margin, yours might be higher, yours might be lower. That is not a number to aspire to. Every business is different. Don't take that number and go like, oh my God, we're not at 25% or like, wow, we're at 30%. We rock. No, every business is different. This is just an example. So at 25%, then that business needs to, to have gross revenues of $2 million. If your average case value is $10,000, that's a 200 new cases for the year. And if you convert, if your sales team converts typically at a 33% rate, again, just an example number, yours might be higher, yours might be lower, and it's not a better than or worse than, every business is different, then you know that you need 600 sales calls per year. That the, the, the other two that I did in orange, that's for your marketing plan. This is what sales' job is. Sales' job is to deliver 200 new cases on 600 sales calls. If these are your numbers, your numbers, of course, will be different, but you can't have a conversation about sales, about being diligent about your sales process until you've decided what sales job is so that you can then over time measure against that plan and decide whether sales is on plan or off plan. And if off plan, what you're going to do about it. Okay. Really important to start with that thought. So the job of sales in your business is to deliver revenue. The job of sales in your business is to deliver clients that have decided to do business with you, not clients who you convinced to do business with you, clients who have decided to do business with you. And that feeds into the business of the law firm, which is, I've said this to every client I've worked with over the past five years. The business of a law firm is to sell and then deliver legal services. And of course, this seminar, this webinar today is going to be talking about the sales part of that. Um, let's make, you know, we get to do a lot of things as lawyers, but these are the two core things. We've got to sell the legal services. Otherwise, we've got nobody to work for. And we've got to deliver what we sold. Otherwise, well, that causes a whole other problem. All right. Why should you be listening to me? Just real quick introduction as to who the hell I am. Um, you know, Elliot told you that I, I work with uh, with Empirical. That's not who I am. It's just uh, Empirical has been a great partner in our growth. We started, um, as you can see, I've started and uh, built a bunch of law firms. Um, this isn't all of them. Um, it's just the ones that we're currently operating. Um, and um, we... Uh, Worked with you know, started working with Empirical to build um, the new Lee family of firms. That's what we started doing three years ago. Brand new adventure. Um, and we also brought Anderson Dotson into the fold uh, with them as well. Um, but what I've also been doing is teaching um, this triangle system for explosive law firm growth to law firms across the country. I work um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis with some some special members. We have a we have a. a a podcast called The Unbillable Hour. Um, we uh, and, and there's a live show of that every every month. So check us out. Um, but but so I've been teaching this stuff for a long, long time. Um, all the time that I've been growing law firms for the past 20 some years, I've been teaching as well um, because it's what helps me learn the best. And then I love to bring what I learn um, about explosive explosive growth 
to all of you. And what Elliot's been talking about, Empirical's been key in that explosive growth. We've re- we have grown um, from zero, from just zero, um, to we're going to end this year right at about six um, million dollars in gross revenue in that short time frame. So, you know, we took our first client in January of 2021. So just to kind of give you an idea how this stuff works, it works. Um, and so uh, I'm glad to help you with it and glad to present this information here today because I think if you use what I use, what I spell out today, it'll probably improve a whole lot of your business right away. All right. So part two, sales, again, in quotes, done right. It's all about helping your prospect to see value. Um, and, you know, because again, it's not about convincing them of anything. They It's to help them to see value. So first question I have to you is about feeling because it, it really has to do with you or whoever your sales team is. How do you feel about sales? Right. If you recharacterize it as a service in the way that I just talked about, um, how do you? Second, here we go. Um, how are you going to feel if I'm going to sell for you? Because how you feel about that is going to be determinative of how you feel about selling for others. Um, and so I just put that out there. Like if you, like you come to a webinar, here's this guy, I've got this logo down here, Sunnyside Services. Um, I am probably, Elliot mentioned, I'm kind of a busy guy. It's true. Um, do I do this just because I get jazzed about, um, helping others? Well, you know what? Kind of a little bit, but, um, Sunnyside's a business and Sunnyside is the business that helps other law firms grow. And I'm here to see if you want to work with me. Um, that's part of part of the part of the show here. And so, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about like a lot of webinars? People don't admit that that's what it's about. They're all about that, right? But how do you feel about that right now? You're like, oh shoot, what did I sign up for here? Is this some sort of pitch? No, it's not. It's a lesson. But if you feel negatively about the fact that I'm going to have a call to action at the end of this, we need to check that emotion and understand where that's coming from because that's affecting your sales in your business as well. All right, let's talk about it. Um, first of all, what is selling? I think I've already buried this lead a little bit, but I want to talk about what is selling. I've already talked a lot about what it's not, right? It is not about convincing anybody to do anything. The minute you're convincing anybody to do anything, the minute you feel like you're twisting someone's arm or or, or really giving them the hard sell, um, you're off the rails. And you might be successful. You know, again, back to the trope, the used car salesmen, the the schmarmy ones, the ones that we kind of like cringe about, you know what? They're successful. They do sell, but they don't generally leave behind them a trail of happy customers that are ambassadors. They, They convince people and people then have buyer's remorse. And all sorts of other problems. We're, that, that, that's not the selling I'm talking about. What is selling then? I've given you all the negatives. Here's the positive. Selling is educating your prospects on whether they can make a profit working with you. What? How can they make a profit working with you? You're, most, most law firms are asking them to give you money not to take anything from you. Well, that's not true. They can make a profit working with you because their life after working with you is better than their life would have been not working with you. And the difference between their life, their future, their whatever the the transaction is that's going on before working with you and after working with you is a value that you provide to them. If you're a criminal lawyer, you know, working with you and not getting a DUI for an airline pilot versus not working with you and taking a DUI conviction when you're an airline pilot, huge difference in value. And they make a profit if you're able to deliver that value to them at a price point that's less than the value it was to them. So for an airline pilot, that might be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And if you can represent them for $7,000, $8,000, $10,000 in that DUI, that's a huge profit for them. Family law, same thing. What does their future look like after an excellent representation by your firm versus going it alone or going with the cheaper firm? Um, You need to deliver whatever that value is at less than 
what the uh, you deliver the value to them at a cost that is less than that value. That's how they make a profit. You have to be able to have to help them see that to make a decision whether they can, in fact, make that profit. Now, how do you do that? And that's the key. The key is that what selling actually is, is helping a prospect create a new vision of their future. Now, if you're in business transactions, it's pretty easy. The transaction, you know, to measure the value, that's pretty easy. So we'll talk about some of the more um, difficult to see. The state plan, family law, criminal law, um, intellectual property. Like those values are a little bit more nebulous. But if you paint a future that includes the service that you did and help the client to see that future, which they may not clearly see when they first come to you, that is selling. That is providing a service because whether they end up working with you or not, that vision of their future that they didn't have before will stay with them and they can go seek it or not, but at least they can go seek it, whether it's with you or with someone else. Okay. I I hope that webinars are weird because like there's the only person I'm looking at is is Elliot and Elliot's like, yeah, I know this stuff. Um, But so I got, I don't get to see your smiling faces or you're like, I don't buy this shit. Big faces. Oops. I said, oops. Um, you want me to smile more? I can smile more. Oh. <laughs> That's right. I'm not actually looking at you, man. Um, the, uh, the, uh, oh, the, what I was looking for is like feedback. Am, am I getting there? And I guess, you know, if not put some stuff in the Q and a, we'll definitely ask that. All right. So then if we understand the definition of selling, then we have to ask, answer the question why is your prospect talking to you? Why is your prospect talking to you? And this is, again, where a lot of lawyers get this wrong. Clue, for the most part, nobody actually wants to buy legal services. Nobody really cares about legal services except us. Your client is talking to you because she has a problem. Occasionally, with like business law or whatever, it could be because she has an opportunity, but your, your prospect is talking to you because she has a problem or an opportunity that a lawyer might be the best person to help her with. Right? So her spouse has asked for a divorce. That's a problem. Um, she's been arrested. That's a problem. She wants to buy a business. That's an opportunity. And you may be the right person to talk to about that. Very few people come to talk to a lawyer just because they're bored. Bartenders usually get the most of that business. So they're coming to you to solve a problem and they want to profit. They want to pay something that's less than, significantly less than what the problem is worth to them. Solving the problem is worth to them or seizing the opportunity is worth to them. So, you know, just to drive that point home, if uh, if I had an ATM that I put it outside my business and you stick in $20 bill and it pumps out a $100 bill every time you do that, you know, would you come and do that? And the answer is, of course you will. So you need to, in the sales process, be making that value clear, but it doesn't have to be money. So let's talk about um, cake, all right? We'll talk, we're going to talk about cake later. So I'm going to talk about cake now. I don't like vanilla cake. I don't like angel food cake. I love chocolate cake. Some people might like vanilla cake and not really be a fan of chocolate cake. And if anybody likes carrot cake, I don't understand you. Um, But uh, so profit can also be just exchanging something you want and value less, vanilla cake, for something you want and value more, chocolate cake. And if you can do that with someone who has the opposite feels, you can both profit because you both have ended up with something you want more in exchange for something you want less. So again, back to the criminal one, right? What I want more is to not be convicted of DUI. What I want less at this moment than that is some money. So I'm willing to fork over some money, which I want less than not being convicted of DUI. People giving you their problem and some money in exchange for the future that you've helped them to 
envision. In doing that, it's also important to understand that you must come to sales from a perspective of love. Sales is all about giving love to your prospect. Sales is all about giving love to your prospect. To the extent and at any moment you use sales to get love from your prospect, to get self-esteem, to get recognition, to get adulation from your prospect, you're going off the rails. And a lot of people do. So a lot of people are not willing to tell their prospects the truth, not willing to say your goals in this case are not realistic or, you know, are unachievable, but, and then, you know, to direct them in the way that they can go to help them paint a future that is achievable rather than pie in the sky. People do that to get love. And then you're, you're turning into the used car salesman, right? Because you're, you're painting a picture. Well, this beauty will take you down the road. It'll cost you nothing. And get like, you're just getting love. You're getting their adulation in the moment, but you're not going to be able to fulfill. But by giving love and telling the truth, you might lose the sale from time to time, but you will have helped them build a vision of their future. You cannot be effective if you're not willing to give love to your prospect and you have no need to get it from them. You tell them the hard truths. And then when you ask the tough questions, you hold that silence until they can give you a clearer vision of their future. Let them answer. Don't supply them with answers to the tough questions. Hold them in that place until they tell you their future, until they paint that picture. If you don't follow this, if you don't give love and refrain from getting love, you will often get a yes in your sales, but it's a false yes, and it will blow up in your face and not result in clients, A, that appreciate um, the value that you brought to them and or stick around. All right. So that's what you bring to it. So what then, remember I just, we started this with what is selling. Now we're going to talk about what are they buying? What are they buying? Not you. Okay. Not you. Please. For the most part, legal sales are to unsophisticated consumers. Not all of them, but for the most part. What they know about buying legal services, quite honestly, is what we teach them about buying legal services. And we get influenced by, we attorneys get influenced by like, what is it, the top lawyers and uh, super lawyers and AV rated and AVO 10 and all these other credentials that are meant to pump us up. And there is a use for them typically in marketing, right? Um, But it's, they're not buying you. So the time you waste in your sales process, talking about um, your personal uh, credentials or having, there's actually room for the team. If you have a sales team to sell your credentials, that's okay. Cause it's not, the person speaking. That's actually okay. We'll talk about that in a minute. But if it's you, it's not you. What are they buying? Well, I've already told you. Well, they're buying two things, one of which I've told you. The one I've told you is they're buying their future. They're buying a vision of their future that's better because of what you will do for them. The other one is, and this is huge, is they're buying certainty. They are coming to you in a world of uncertainty, not knowing what the process is going to be, not knowing what the future is going to be. And you're going to help paint that and give them a more, listen, we're not allowed to ethically promise a result. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is a certainty of process, a certainty about how things are going to go, what might happen one way or might might happen the other way, but you're giving them more certainty than they've got because you've been there, done that, and they haven't. This is what they're buying. And you are selling what they're buying. You're selling that vision of their future. If they value that future, then what you are selling is worth a lot to them. If they don't value that future 
and you haven't been able to communicate the value of that future to them, then what you're selling is not a worth a lot to them. And you probably shouldn't make the sale. Didn't say won't, because you probably could, but probably shouldn't make the sale. But the most important thing is, it's not about you. Who is it about? It's about them. It's not about their spouse. It's not about the state. It's not about whoever did done them wrong. It's about them. There's nothing more to say about that. It's about them. So every bit of the sales conversation needs to be turned around to them, to your prospect, to how their life is going to be better by working with them. And then always be keeping in mind um, something that's very, very important, which is there's something about solving their problem or actually achieving the opportunity that scares your client. Um, And again, this is a whole nother webinar, which I actually love. But it's really important, particularly in law and particularly in criminal law, family law, um, sometimes estate planning and, and, and business transactions is actually important too, is that the problem that your client comes to you with is part of their identity. They probably lived with it for a little while and they don't know what it, life is like without it. And so solving their problem is scary and they wouldn't identify it as scary. But we all, as human beings, have an aversion to change. It's just, it's it's in our, I mean, it's in the lizard part of our brain. It's, it's so baked in. Change is scary. And the only antidote to it is certainty and a clear vision of what comes next, of what comes after. And that's what you help to provide your client and your prospect. And then the last, last item on that is just... Uh, And we're going to go to process here in a second, but going back to the, if the, the, if the future that you painted is not worth it to them, or is even distasteful to them, then you shouldn't probably sell and you can't probably sell because you can't build value on it. Um, No matter how inexpensive you want to offer your service, if they don't want it, it's too much. Um, You know, you could do everything you want to make me want dessert or value dessert. But if the dessert you've got is red bean ice cream, I ain't having none of it. And you can't make it valuable for me because I hate this stuff, right? So what what you have as a solution, what you have as a future that you can help them achieve, if it's not valuable to them, like red bean ice cream ain't valuable to me, you got no shot. And you shouldn't sell because you will have a disgruntled client somewhere down the road. All right. What does this all look like then? Let's see. I hope. Yeah. Okay. That one had to build. Okay. What does this all look like? How do you have this conversation I've been talking about? How do you um, bring this love? How do you bring a conversation about the client and not in a way that is salesy in the way that we don't like? All right. The sales conversation has four key components. Then we're going to talk about five keys to conversion. The four key components here is, first of all, in a sales conversation, make sure to open the conversation. Don't just jump in. Show the client, the prospect, some respect. And demand that respect for yourself. So you start with, the opening, which confirms three things. One, do we have the time to have this conversation? You booked 30 minutes. You booked 20 minutes. You booked a half an hour. I mean, sorry, you booked 45 minutes, whatever it is. Um, Is that time still good for you? If it's not, reschedule. Because you know how long, you know, if they go, no, I've got 15 minutes. Can you do this in 15 minutes? If you can't do it in 15 minutes, say, no, I'm sorry. I cannot um, give you the information that you need to make a good decision about whether to do business with us in 15 minutes. I just can't do that. It would be better to reschedule because otherwise I'll be, I'll be selling you short. I'll be not delivering the value in this conversation that I intended to deliver. Um, Make sure that they understand it's confidential communication and give them a preview. All right. So here's what we're going to talk about. 
during this conversation, we're going to um, I'm going to listen a little bit about what's going on. I want to understand what um, you know what you've come here with, what the problem or opportunity is that you've come here with. Excuse me. A second. Um, and then um, we're going to talk about if we think you know there's a path to a better future for you. I'm going to try to explore what the uh, options are for that and what what services we might be able to bring to bear um, so that you'll understand what your options are and you'll be able to make a decision. Um, we want to, uh, in the problem identification, sorry, in, this, in the second part, it, both understanding the problem, but also what have you tried already? Um, how is this currently affecting you in terms of, you know, is it costing you anything right now, this problem? Um, is it uh, costing you time? Is it costing you in the way that people around you are thinking about you? Um, what else is going on that's important to you? And where do you want to be going forward? And then we'll explore the options. Sorry, I didn't want to skip over that about um, what we what services we might be able to bring to bear. And then finally, we close the sales conversation with, do you understand all the options that I've explored with you? Um, are you ready to make a decision um, to about whether or not to work with us. And remember, it's about whether or not to work with us. No is good. It's not doesn't feel as good as yes, but no is good. You've had a successful sales conversation when they can make that decision where you do not want to end up is, I'm not sure. And then the very end of the close of the conversation is, okay, what's what's going to be next? I'm going to send you a fee agreement. Or are you going to sign it right now if you're in front of me? Um, and you know, we're going to schedule our kickoff meeting and all the other things. But that goes to the very, very end. That is the structure of the conversation. What has to happen inside that conversation? I want to be really clear about this. These keys to conversion have to happen in order. If you do not reach one of these stages, you go back to the one before. The, as you move through them, you can't get to the end without going and completing the ones in the middle. All right. Commitment. Right at the beginning of the problem identification, you've got to, at some point, once you've heard what's going on, get a commitment that the prospect actually wants to do something about it. Sometimes just talking it through is what they came for. Sometimes just talking it through is all they've got right now. And that's okay. But it's important to have that clarified early in the conversation. So, you know, I, I appreciate that uh, you um, are concerned that you don't have, you know, you, you've got young children and you don't have an estate plan. You don't have a custody plan for them. You don't, you know, haven't put all the documents around this to protect them. Should something happen to you and your spouse, et cetera. Um, is that something you really want to change right now? Is that something you're willing to put the time and effort into fixing? You know, it would seem obvious say that if they're sitting there, the answer is yes, but sometimes they're like, they just got it off their chest. Um, and they're not willing to make that commitment right now. That's okay. But you want to get them to say yes, right? You ask the question, is that something you want to do something about? The answer is important. If they don't say yes, you can say, listen, when you are, I, you know, we're here for you. Is there any other questions you have for us? But you're ending the conversation. Usually you get past commitment. Clarity. Okay. You want to do something about it. Um what do you want to do? What do you want to end up with here? What's the end look like? This is where you're starting to build that future, right? Clarity as to what the end goal is, the end state for the client is. You build that clarity for them, with them, by asking questions, not by telling them. Do not tell them what the future is. You ask questions about it, but to get them to a point of clarity until you could ask the question is like, are you clear now? Does this seem like what we're trying to get after? Yes. Great. When would you like that to happen? This sounds a little bit like commitment, but it's not. Commitment was I want change. Clarity is this is the change I want. 
urgency is this is a change I want now. Um, and you got to, again, say, so, you know, when would you like that to happen? Again, asking questions. Oh, I don't know. You know, a year or two would be good. No urgency. Now, here's where you can help instigate the urgency by painting alternative futures. Again, you're not telling them it's urgent. Okay. You know, you know a lot of people do like to wait. Now, you know, one of the things that we've seen happen is when people wait on a state plan is sometimes you know, unexpected things happen. And this bad thing is a result. Kids go to foster care. Um, you waited too long and, uh, you know, your, your spouse moved forward with, with the, with the divorce process and some, some things happen in court that are unreversible. Um, you, you just, what are the bad things that could happen by not moving quickly? You can paint them and say, so, you know, based on I just it was important to me. This is where you know you, you're bringing them some advice. This is where I want to deliver you some of the you know some of those possibilities. Does that change how you feel about um, when you would like to get that done? You can help build that urgency by painting alternative futures based on waiting. Yeah, and again, not usually a problem. A lot of people who come to lawyer have that urgency built in. And if you see it, you don't need to belabor it, but you got to make sure it's there because you don't move. If the urgency is not there, don't move forward. Just, all right. Well, you know, when this, when uh, the year's fine, you know, uh, you you understand what bad things could happen and you want to wait a little bit longer. That's absolutely fine. We'll be here for you. And I'll, in fact, what can I follow up with you in three months, six months, nine, whatever it is, but you stop. Once you've established the urgency, now it's time to talk about options. All right, here are the options. We can, you know, you may have different levels of service that you provide. Those could be options. Always include the options of working with someone else and doing it themselves. And my favorite one, ignoring the problem altogether. Um, it's important to include those as options to be complete in and honest with yourself and in integrity with the process about um, this being a conversation to educate, right? Not a conversation to convince. And it's so anti-intuitive to include not working with you, to include doing nothing as an option, but that keeps you in integrity with this process and your clients will really appreciate it. And then finally, all right, based on everything that we've discussed, are you ready to make a decision? The answer is going to be yes. Again, not what is the decision. Are you ready to make a decision about whether or not you want to work with us? <coughs> when you ask this, they may very well say, yes, I want to work with you. That's fine. Or yes, I've made a decision. I don't want to work with you. That's fine. Or they may say, yes, I'm ready to make a decision. Great. Or they may say, no, no, I still need to think about it. I need to talk to my spouse. I need to talk to my dad. I need to talk to my cat. Whatever it might be. If that's the case, you missed, you skipped over one of these. You go like, okay, I can understand that. Um, but listen, you know, I I want to be sure if you're going to have that conversation that we've covered everything. So let me just be clear that this is something that you want to reason and just go back through it because you've missed something. This conversation should lead them to being able to make a decision. Okay. So again, I said I would make it real. So if I were having this conversation with you about your law firm, I would say, you know, you, you people come to me, what's this a sale? So I got to fix my sales process. Great. Um, Why? Why do you need to fix your sales process? Well, because I'm not getting the conversion rates that we need to make, to be successful based on our plan. Okay. That's great. What do you want um that conversion rate to be? going forward. Well, it's about 20% now and I would really like it to be 33%, 35%, 40%. Why do you want it to be 40%? Like what is that important to you? Blah 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 blah. Um all right. Um that is something that uh you know, I have helped a lot of people do. Um you know, when would you like to get that done? Is it important to your business plan that it's done in the first quarter, the first month? Like when is that important to you? All right. Well, I've got these 
different packages, different, different offerings. I can, we can apply to that. And here's where they would bring you. Or of course, you know, you could watch a couple more of my webinars or here's a great book you could read, or, you know, you could ignore the problem and just hope your salespeople improve. You know, which, which way um, the, those, those I think are the options. Have I given you enough information to make a decision and either no or yes. And if it's yes, then you say, well, if you're ready to make a decision, then you can contact us at sunnysidelaw.com slash empirical. Don't need to write that down. I'll give it to you again here in the future. But that's how the process works. Now, if if we were in a live seminar, I would do this actually with one of you. I um, mean, we would take about 15 minutes to do it. Um, but we don't, we're not live and I don't want to do it to Elliot. So that's how it works in real life. And so I wanted to spend the remaining amount of time. I wanted to leave about 10 minutes for Q&A. And so we're right on target for that is I wanted to talk about conversion systems because having this conversation, understanding the conversation and the mindset. First, we talked about the plan. Very important. Then we talked about the mindset, this whole part too. Super important to be able to build those into the way that you process and then finally, there needs to be a system around it. Um, what are the parts of the system? The keys to conversion, as far as the system is concerned, are these. First of all, speed. Depending on what market you're in, this number one can mean different things. If you are in criminal law, I used to say 45 minutes. The truth is it's getting faster. If you don't get to having the sales conversation or at least booking the sales conversation in 30 minutes or less, they're gone. If they're contacting you, they're contacting others and you need to get to them. Family law under an hour for sure. Um, and, and, you know, estate planning, you probably have a few days. Um, and depending on this, like your whole marketing glide path and your sales glide path will be different, but speed to jumping on a lead is so important. You need to get that first communication out to them as soon as possible. And most importantly for, for those, you need to get their story to you. You need to have them talking to someone to whom they can tell their story as quickly as possible. Once they've told it, they get tired of telling it, and you've got more time. But until you get them to that point, they're just dialing. They're I'm old fashioned. They're just hitting the web. They're just they're just scrolling, um, and uh, and they're you're out of sight, out of mind. You you never existed. Got to get them fast. All right. Then, when they talk with someone, the first thing you need to do is you, a lot of people call this different things. We can call it a magic statement. But basically, you need to communicate to them a confidence that this is the type of problem that your firm is particularly good at working, or this is the kind of opportunity that your firm is particularly good at seizing. You want to get that confidence statement. That's why I should call it a confidence statement. You want to get that confidence statement to them as quickly as possible. And if it can come from not you, the owner of the firm, the better, um, because you're the, the person that's having this first communication with them can say with more credibility, you know, I've seen this firm help people with that all the time. They're really good at it. Something you as the owner can't say, but then if it is you, you just say, listen to that, you know, we can definitely help you with that. That's the kind of thing we do all the time. Um, and, uh, and deliver that, that confidence to them. All right. Second or third, sorry, is you want to make sure to get clear about where the prospect is now. And this needs to be in your script. The reason I'm saying this is system is this is what your script, how your first initial intake, you want to get the short version. Where is the prospect now? Where do they want to be? And then figure out some way to deliver an intake testimonial where they're going to get some degree of confidence at the end. So there's like a confidence sandwich here that other people have been helped your way. And you can do that by directing them to testimonials that you've got on your website or another, or that you can put in an email. 
Um, or you can just simply talk about, it. you know, we, we just, I can't give you names. Of course, we just helped somebody specifically with this kind of problem. Now that I understand you, the specifics of your problem, you can relate them to somebody that you helped in exactly the same way. Then if you're doing an intake and then sales conversation, you need to get them on a glide path. Now, if you're if this is going to be the sales conversation, you just continue into the sales conversation that we just talked about. But we're talking process here. And if you're doing intake, we need to get them onto this pre-sales glide path. So one, I'm going to be booking you at the time and date that we just agreed. And then here's what is going to come next. And you talk to them about what the process is going to be because you want to start keeping promises right away. The best, the shortest system, we have a seven-step process. The shortest system is a two-step process where they're going to get at least two communications from you. One is how they're going to get to their appointment. It doesn't matter if this is a physical appointment or a Zoom appointment, but with detail about every step of the way, like how are we going to get to this appointment? You're going to log into Zoom and make sure you've downloaded it ahead of time and blah, blah, blah. Or this is this is how you get into our office with pictures. This is where you park. This is where the door is. This is where the, you, the button you push on the elevator. Um and uh, and you, so just simply process. This is how you're going to get to the appointment. And then the second communication should be a video or some other communication like that. I love videos from the owner with some level of excitement that they're considering working with you, something about the firm, something about other people like them that you've helped, and something about how they're going to be able to make the most use of their time with the team. So the owner should talk about this is when you meet with us, this is what's going to happen. You're going to talk with someone. You're going to talk about these things. Here's the things you should bring. Here's the things you should think about ahead of time to be ready um, for the call. Um, we have great examples of these, but the, you know, these are the two main communications um, that they should be getting from you. If you have time between the booking and the sales call, the last thing they should be getting is that the third communication they should be getting is some sort of package from you with some gifts, some useful materials, some things that they can think about, some homework perhaps, but something in a, that comes to them by an express delivery service um, that will kind of cement that you have already invested in them and that in their problem which will make, again, there's a law out there called the law of reciprocity, make them more likely to feel committed to working with you. If your meetings are in the office, then also work to manage their experience when they meet with you. If it's not, that you use this package. Like maybe this package could include a coffee or you could have asked them, <coughs> excuse me, do you like coffee or tea? And you might've included that in the package. If they're coming, be ready to serve them. Make them feel welcomed. Like one one service I saw I've seen a firm do, for instance, is they go and meet. They have someone waiting at the bottom of the elevator with the person's name, waiting for them. <clears throat> it's about making them feel welcomed and to solve and serve them from the beginning. If they look hungry, if they look wet, if they look cold, solve that before having any conversation about their case. Show that you care about them as a person and that they've got nothing better to do than to have the conversation that you're going to have with them. If you're on Zoom or if you're in your office, try to build a sales environment, right? Um, again, I don't have much going on here, but I do make sure that my company name was in the background, a little bit of a sales environment that has a professional look. Um, if you're bringing them into your office and you do estate planning, have some pictures of happy families that you've helped. Um, if you've done DUI, or sorry, if you're doing criminal, have some articles lying around about how, you know, about successful services that you've done. Build a set, and if you're just on on Zoom, you know, have uh, a background that that solves those same problems, but build an environment that shows that the results that they're looking for, the future that they're looking for, you've delivered to others. All right, last thing is, if they say yes, it ain't over. 
right? And so the last thing I want to talk about is that you want to have a post sales glide path. You want to be following up with your your prospect immediately after saying, "Hey, did that? Did everything go as expected? And are you sure about what's happening next?" What we call the welcome call. Um, you want to check in about a couple of weeks, a week to two weeks into the representation. You want to have somebody from the sales team or from you check in and see how it's going. This is the equivalent of the waiter coming to your table and saying, "You know, how are your first bites? Why do we do this? We do this because when the waiter comes and say, how are your first bites? If there's an issue, the waiter has an opportunity. You have an opportunity to make it better and to make the experience a positive one because they haven't complained. You asked. And so, and when you, when there, if there is a complaint and you then go over the top, making it better, the overall experience is better. There's a, um, a lot of research about this. There's a great book called Moments. Um, which I'll be glad to share with you. Then before they get their first bill, you want to check in again. This is your last opportunity to make it a great experience. Anything that happens after this is a complaint. And the best you can do is to make things even, right? But beforehand, you can still make it delightful. You can go over the top and create a an excited customer, excited ambassador. And that's the sale continues through all of that. The sale's not nailed down until then. All right. I said I'd leave time for Q&A. So one last thing about me. Um, um, what do we do? We help law firm owners liberate themselves from the jobs they've created to become successful law firm business owners. If you want to know more, um, you can use this uh, URL here, sunnysidelaw.com slash empirical. Um, get a, you know, we usually charge $150 um, for an initial consult um, because empirical has asked me to, um, we are providing these free of charge just to listeners and attendees of this webinar. So that's how you get in touch with us. Um, and with that, I just want to say thank you and ask Elliot if we have any questions. Yes, we have a couple and don't be shy. Um, first question, I don't know if you can see it, Chris, I'll just read it out. Can you speak to those prospects that are only thinking about money? Meaning we know walking in the door, they already are thinking about how much it's going to cost. Do you speak to that up front? And what about at the end of the conversation? How do you incorporate the cost of working with us? Yeah, so I think that's a great, great question. Um, and the answer is, first of all, you do not avoid the question, right? We're absolutely going to talk about the, you know, what what it's going to cost you to work with us to get the the service that would be the right service for you. At this moment, I'm not sure what that'll be. So I don't want to, um, you know, start talking about cost when I don't want to, uh, when I don't understand enough about your your problem or your opportunity and about what you think are going to be the best one of our services to uh, to provide for you. Um, it's like walking into a restaurant going like, how much does this restaurant cost, right? I don't know. Are you hungry? <laughs> um, what do you like to eat? You know, what, what, what do you have a hankering for? Um, and so, you know, you just you turn that a little bit to say it would be unfair of me to talk to you about cost when I don't even understand whether we're the right firm to work with you yet. Um, and if we are, what what services would make the most sense? But we will talk about it, I promise. And then you can stick in a question. I love this question. But tell you what, so that we understand each other. Is price, is the cost going to be the number one most important factor in you deciding whether or not to work with us? Ask it right up front. When they, if they come up with that price question, be, be fearless in asking that question. Is cost or the price going to be your number one consideration about whether or not to work with us? 80% plus of people will say, no, of course not. I need to know what you're going to do for me. And that's what you want. Because now you can have that honest conversation later. If they say yes, you know you've got someone who's probably not going to be buying. Um, but like I said, more than 80% will say no. Um, if they say yes, you can you can then go down like, well, so you know, did you have did you come intending to spend a certain amount of money without understanding what the solutions might be? And you could kind of challenge them a little bit to get them back to a no, but you know, 
some people are there just on price and it's good to let them go earlier than later. All right. I hope that answers that question. Yeah. One, one more and people don't be shy. You can use the Q and a feature. Uh, you mentioned getting Google reviews. Can you talk a little more about your system to obtain those on the sales side? Sure. Yeah. Um, here's the system. Ready, everybody? Ask for them. Um, that's the most important. So the system includes also if they, so first of all, you want to make sure that they want to send one that they want to send a good one. When they want to send a good one, send them a link by their favorite method, either by text or um, from by uh, email. Or, you know, if you're on a chat, you can put it right in the chat right here. You send them a link to the link that gives drives them directly to the review service you want to use. Most of the time, it's probably going to be Google reviews. But if you want, if you want, <laughs> excuse me, if you want and or need a Yelp review or um, a Avo review or a Microsoft team review or whatever, send them a link to that one. But each one has a link that you can use. It's important that you send them the link that they do it from their own computer. Um, otherwise you're going to get uh, problems with these services, right? So you send them a link, but you can certainly ask the question about, you know, whether they intend to send a positive review. If they're not going to send a positive review, send them an internal link where they can put their negative review um, and you can then deal with it. Um, but that's, uh, that's, that's the system. So you have, uh, we, we've got a series of emails that include the link, um, the first email just asks if they're willing to, and when they say yes, uh, if they're willing to send a five-star review, when they say yes, then they get the link. Um, but uh, the, the real key, quite honestly, like so many people want to have like all these technological solutions to stuff. Like, oh, what's the high-tech way to automate getting links, uh, getting reviews? Ask for them. One-on-one, -on -one, in person. Say, hey, you know has and by the way don't wait to the end of the representation when you've had a success along the way say you know it really helps us when other clients see you know that we've helped you would you be willing to leave a five-star review right now they will all right next question uh, we got a hello for Fried Markcroft. Great job, Chris. <laughs> and uh, Elizabeth says, when you have a client who does not see the value of the future, even if it's the reasonable result, how long should you keep them in a glide path before letting go? Not long at all. <clears throat> Remember, what you do is you paint them the negative picture then, right? If they don't see the value of the future, even if it's a reasonable result, then paint them the negative result. Okay, if you don't work with us, this is the future that's likely to happen. Are you okay with that? If it's yes, then they're okay with that. You're done. Again, we're not here to convince them of anything. God forbid we convince them of, of, of valuing their future. Like that, that, we're not shrinks. We, our job is to help them see. Because sometimes when they come to you in crisis, they don't see. If your client is running away from a present, it's your job to help them start running towards a future. Because that's how they'll see that value. But if they see that future and they don't value it, refer them a good therapist, but you're done. Uh, next question. Yes, there will be a recording. Um, any other questions? We got one minute. I'm going to put uh, a recording of this out. It will have Chris's personal link to it. If you guys want to get a hold of Chris, obviously I highly recommend it. I just learned a ton. I hope you guys did too. If there's no more questions, we're going to sign off. We thank you all for coming. And Christopher, thank you so much. That was amazing. Very, very thank, exciting. Thank you. Um, I really uh, appreciate uh, Empirical willing to uh, host this. Um, it's been it's been great. Been been excited talking to everybody. Um, and I hope I hope we delivered some value in the webinar. So with that, thank you all very much. And you have a great rest of your day. All right. Bye, everybody.